Welcome, I hope you're blessed in the Lord today. In this video, we're gonna to continue to look at some presuppositions uh, that are held by those that believe in the free grace form of once saved, always saved. We're interacting with a video and looking at some clips from a video that was put out by the Standing for Truth YouTube channel. I encourage you to go to the Standing for Truth YouTube channel and check out some of their debates. Uh, the brother Donnie on there has a lot of people come in with a lot of different theological topics and you can learn a lot just by hearing uh, the different sides and brother Donnie does a good job of letting people kind of have their say and not interjecting his perspective. Uh, and so that's a, it's a good place to go to be able, if you're interested in kind of, uh, struggling through or wrestling through some of the theological debates that are in the world today. But let's go ahead and look at one of the presuppositions. We're going to look at a clip and one of the arguments that's made in this conversation from Standing for Truth channel. And then we want to look and see if we can recognize some presuppositions in this argument. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Growing up in my family's, my dad's house, my dad was Marine, World War II, only survivor of his platoon. I, I wanted badly to please my dad. I wanted him to be proud of me. I was never afraid of losing my sonship. I was afraid of losing my fellowship, afraid of losing his favor, but never afraid of losing his losing my sonship. I don't understand people who believe they can lose their salvation. I think it's just insane. So the argument is basically, look, if you're a child of God, then God will never make you not his child because, I mean, would you disown your child? I mean, why would somebody do that? So in this clip, uh, Mr. Hovind says, look, you know, I, I was never worried about not being my father's son because I'm always going to be recognized as his son positionally. I'm always going to be his son, even if maybe I don't have fellowship with him or whatever, but I'm always his son. And the, 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 the presupposition that is held here is that no father, and particularly God, would ever disown his child. And so the first thing that I have to say about this is this is very, very much a cultural argument, uh, or even before I get to the cultural aspect, this is very much an argument from kind of an appeal to emotion. In other words, you know, don't you love your little son? I mean, if you're, your little son, you know, your three-year-old son is walking and he falls down and he gets dirty, are you just going to pick him up and beat him and then throw him out and say, you're not my son anymore? You know, I mean, are you going to be so cruel that you would just reject your son because he gets a little dirty? I mean, you would never do that. I mean, you love your little son. He's so so cute. Okay, that's the first that's the first way that this argument appeals to us because when we think about our children, we're usually thinking about our little children. We're thinking about our, our little child that makes a little faux pas or a little mistake. And I mean, would you cast him out and throw him on the street? But it changes a little bit in our emotional sense if we think, wait a second, my 30-year-old son is a meth addict. He keeps coming and stealing stuff from our house every time we let him stay here. You know, he beats up my wife. You know, he's threatened to kill us many times. And so I've had to disown him and I don't let him come anywhere near. I don't have any relationship with him. And in fact, when people say, look, is that your son? I say, no, he's not my son. Don't, don't let him use my name in any way. Don't give him any, uh, you know, help from you because it's, he's a very dangerous guy. Stay away from that guy. So... Wait a second. When we take that picture into to mind, when we think about you know people that say that they are children of God rebelling against the living God in treachery, just living in rebellion, just just disdaining God altogether and doing what they want, we can at least emotionally feel a little bit. Well, okay, that's a little bit more reasonable. Maybe a just and a holy God that created hell for wicked men, maybe he would disown such a one. So that's just the the argument from the emotion. It's not a little child we're talking about. We're talking about rebellious human beings against a holy and a living God. But also, there's a cultural aspect because most of the time this argument is made, that I've heard it made, it's, it's made by those that are maybe American or that are in a Western culture. And I'm not sure that you're aware, but American culture is not the way that the whole world works. And it's not that the way uh, the culture was in the time of the biblical writing. So when we think about uh, a father, you know, it's like, you know, maybe even in our day, people be like, oh, don't even spank. There's, there's a certain kind of view that we have about what a father's role is supposed to be. And the main thing in an American culture, the main thing is that you would never disown your children. So to use the American model, the American mindset, the American culture to determine what God would or would not do is just faulty 
Because if we were in, in today's time, if we were to go to the Middle East, if you go to uh, other countries that are in the Middle East or in, in, in Southeast Asia, and somebody becomes a Christian, somebody from a, a different religion, they become a Christian, they might be disowned by their parents. Not only disowned, they might be beaten, they might be killed by their parents. Now for us, in maybe a, a Western mindset, we think, well, how can that be? What, a, you know, what kind of culture is that? But that's the culture that the Bible was written in. People were disowned in biblical times. People were disowned. In fact, in the law of Moses itself, it says if a son comes, or, you know, strikes his mother or father, he should be brought to the city gate and then he should be stoned to death. And I believe it says that the parents should be the first ones to throw the stone. And so the culture of the Bible is not uh, American, Western, modern culture. And so the idea of disowning a child that was indeed our child is not something so foreign to biblical culture. So we can't just get wrapped up in this emotional argument, our cute little kid, we would never disown him. Or, yeah, I mean, even my adult son, if he was a meth addict and he did all these things, I might not let him come into the house, but he would still be my son. Okay, that's, that's an American mindset. That's American culture. That's not a biblical culture. That's not the culture of a, a lot of parts of, of the world even today, but particularly back then. And so this argument is not a biblical argument. It's just an emotional and a cultural argument. Now, let's take a look at what the Bible does say. Let's start in Matthew chapter 10. Now, this is Jesus speaking about uh, persecution, not fearing men. Let's start there. Therefore, do not fear them, for nothing is covered that will not, not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. So here, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says that God is their father. And he is warning them not even about sin and unbelief. He's warning them, uh, or he's talking to them about going through difficulty and persecution. Okay, and this is what he's telling them. And he's telling them, look, your father cares for you. So it doesn't matter if they kill your body because your father cares for you. You should fear him instead of trying to, instead of fearing them. And so this is the context of what he's talking about. But then he goes on in verse 32, still speaking to the same disciples that he says are children of God. Whoever will confess me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever deny, who will deny me before men, him I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So here he's not even talking about uh, an atheist that denies, okay, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. I, I, I don't believe that. You know, I deny the Christian religion. He's not talking about that. He's talking about people who are under persecution, though they still believe in their heart. And yet, because of their fear of men and their fear of what's coming on them, they deny with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus say? If anyone denies me, I will deny him. It says more than that. It doesn't say, if, I den if you deny me, I will deny you. It says, I will deny you before the Father. I will reject you before the Father. This is talking about our right standing and justification before God Almighty. Because our mediator, if our mediator refuses to be an advocate for us, refuses to intercede for us, then what hope do we have before a holy God? This is why those of the early centuries, the early Christians, whenever they were brought before lions, they didn't say, well, look, I'm once saved, always saved. It doesn't matter what I say. I believe in my heart. And even if I stop believing, I'm still going to heaven. No, they understood that if they were to deny Jesus Christ before men, then Jesus Christ would deny them, would no longer intercede for them, would no longer be their advocate, their savior, their high priest, but would deny them before the Father. And so this is the way the Bible speaks. And so even of God's children, even of God's children, they can be disowned. We see this, we see this exemplified if we go to slightly different context, but the, the, the same meaning about being disowned. If we go to Matthew chapter 7, verse, uh, starting verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So these people confess Christ. Okay, They confess him with their mouth. 
So it's different than what was in Matthew 10. Shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, a quick note here. Let me make a quick note. I won't spend a long time on this point, but let me say this. Some here will say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. They'll say, okay, the will of the Father is just to believe on the Son. They'll go to, to John or they'll go to different places. Of course, we know the context of this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the conclusion. So he's talking about the commands that he's been given, and he has just shared the will of the Father. But to make this even more abundantly clear, if we go to the parallel passage, the passage that is just the same, we can see the context. If you look before and after, Jesus is talking about the same thing. But we look in Luke chapter uh, 6, verse 46. He says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And then he says, Whoever comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you whom he is like. So here in Matthew, when it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, he's saying, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, but doesn't do what I say, they will not enter, uh, it says, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So just because we say, Lord, Lord, but don't do what Jesus says, we can't expect to enter the kingdom of heaven. But going on, verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works in your name? So none of these are the things that were commanded in the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't command any of these in the Sermon on the Mount. So they are doing other things. They're doing religious activities, maybe even spiritual activities. You know, they're doing ministry. They're doing all these things, but they're not referring back to what Jesus told them to do, which was namely to, to live in obedience to his commands, as it says in the Great Commission, go make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. So they, they brought up some other things that he didn't mention. And then verse 23, but then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice evil. So these men that are going to be standing there, they said, we did all these things, we did all these things, but we didn't obey your commands. We lived, you who practice evil, and the word there is lawlessness. Those who practice lawlessness, they don't live in submission to the law of Jesus Christ. But it says this, I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. Now, many will make much of this and say, oh, that means they were never Christians in the first place, you know, or it couldn't be that they were, they were Christians because he says, I never knew you. In the past tense, I, 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 I never knew you. You were never truly a Christian. But that's not what he's saying if we understand the context of the Middle East. In the Middle East, there was, if you wanted to disown your son, you would say, you are dead to me. I never know you. You do not bear my name. You are in no relation to me. They would, in the strongest possible terms, say that there is no connection. So not only do I not know you now and I reject you now as my son, you've never been my son. I've never known you. You've never been in this family. You have no part with us, past, present, or future. You are not part of us. This is Jesus Christ not confessing men before the Father. This is Jesus Christ disowning men who, though they confess his name, they do not live for him. And we can see this if we jump over to uh, for Tim, Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 15. To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their minds and consciences are defiled. They profess that they know God, but in their deeds they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and worthless for every good work. In other words, you say, Lord, Lord, but you walk in, war, uh, in lawlessness. Behold, I never knew you. I disown you before my Father. And so when we come to this argument that says, look, God is our Father, and would you ever disown your child? You know, maybe we wouldn't disown our child, but that doesn't have to do with what God says in his word. If we say, well, in our culture, that would be a bad thing to disown your child, but in not in all cultures. In some cultures, it's, it's perfectly respectable to dis disown your child. In fact, if you kept you know, your child that was coming and stealing from you and doing all these things and you kept them as your child, that might be something that was frowned upon. In fact, in the law, it said that you should take him on and stone him if he strikes you. And so we see that this mindset, this uh, Western or American or modern mindset that says, oh, okay, see, God would never disown us because I would never disown my child. That's not a biblical argument. The scripture says that God will disown those that deny Christ. And they can deny him not only with their mouth, but they can also deny him with their life. It says they profess that they know God, but in their deeds they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and worthless for every good work. So I hope this has been helpful to see that there is a presupposition behind the argument that says 
Oh, but you wouldn't disown your child, so God won't disown you. No. If you call on him who is Father, then walk in a holy and godly fear, knowing that we will stand before him. Let's go ahead and close with that. In 1 Peter, I forgot the word, so we better go to it. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 14. As obedient children, do not conduct yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your sojourning. So this scripture tells us that God is our father, a father that we should fear because he's holy. And so that we should walk holy because he's going to judge us according to our works. Hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.